Hello and welcome to Close Up with The Hollywood Reporter. I'm Carolyn Jardina and I'm here with Nora Toomey, Chris McKay, Lee Unkrich, Kyle Balda, Lori Forte, and Tom McGrath. So first question, what do you enjoy most about bringing an animated character to life? The thing that I enjoy the most about bringing an animated character to life is being in the audience where people are being moved by the character. You know, you're, you're starting with nothing. You're starting with like a computer model, uh, the voice, putting it all together, and you're trying to create a performance that, char that audiences can have empathy for uh, and they, they can be rooted in, you know, and I think that's, that's the kind of magic I think that feels so great when you see the audience responding, responding to that. When you're selecting the voice, how much do you consider their public persona? For me, quite a bit, I think, yeah, uh, that you want to play off, either play off something or uh, in the case of like somebody like Will Arnett, somebody who's really good at doing fragile men uh, and poking holes in, in, in the superego kind of person. Uh, so I, I think about that a lot. When you were creating Will's character, um, to what extent did you consider the way Ben Affleck or Christian Bale has played Batman? <laughs> Uh, there was yeah, there was a, a lot of discussions about that and about I mean, at, at when we first did the first Lego Movie, uh, the, the Ben Affleck version wasn't out yet, but we were you know we were thinking about the way Batman's been portrayed in every media and and uh, and the idea of having this guy ha you know have this incredible uh, ego. You think you're my greatest enemy? Yes, you're obsessed with me. <laughs> no, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. Who else drives you to one-up them the way that I do? Bane. No, he doesn't. Superman. Superman's not a bad guy. Then I'd say that I don't currently have a bad guy. I am fighting a few different people. What? I like to fight around. One of the, the, the joys of being able to do a character like this is to, because we have a lot of kids who can't go see Batman versus Superman or Suicide Squad and don't have, um, maybe they have a relationship with Batman through the comics, but we could be the first movie that sort of, uh, introduces them to Batman and, the, and that world and, and stuff like that. So that's, it's really rewarding to be able to do that. All right. Laurie, what made John Cena the right actor to play Ferdinand? To me, John embodies Ferdinand. I mean, he is this big, hulking wrestler, and he's got muscles that have muscles. He's just enormous. And you think that you should be scared of him, that he's, he's a brute, that he's fierce, that he's, and he's so the opposite. I'm Ferdinand. You look at me and think big. You think scary. You think, well, at least he's not in a china shop. Oh no. John loves this and identifies with this character so much. And as a matter of fact, he mentioned to us in the first the first time we met him that he loved this character because he felt growing up he was that character. He was bullied when he was a kid and he was smaller when he was a kid. And so he decided to buff up and work out and he's did not done that his whole life and he, basically people don't bother him anymore. They don't bully him anymore. But I think it's the I think it's the the sort of the theme of our movie really is you can't judge a bull by its cover. You can't really look at someone and you shouldn't really look at someone and judge them for what they look on the outside because really who they are is really who they are in their heart and on the inside. And that John embodies that completely. Lee, how did you find your Miguel? It's really hard to find kids who can act. And I knew that going into this project and it proved to be very true because we saw hundreds and hundreds of kids all over the United States and in Mexico. And um, we just, I had, to, I had to thread such a needle with Miguel because I needed a kid of a certain age. He needed to be Latino. He needed to be able to sing. I, I needed him to be around 12, but you know, animated movies take so long to make, I couldn't have his voice change on me. You wanna be like your hero? You should sign up. Uh-uh, my family would freak. Look, if you're too scared, then well, have fun making shoes. Come on, what did De La Cruz always say? Seize your moment? Show me what you got, muchacho. I'll be your first audience. Thankfully, one day, um, Anthony Gonzalez walked into our lives. And uh, we originally hired him just to do kind of temp scratch voice for our story reels. Uh -huh. And um, one day, we just turned to each other and we said, you know what, I think we found our Miguel. That's great. That's cool. 
And Nora, for the, the breadwinner is a story about a young girl growing up under the Taliban regime. Um, could you talk about how you found your protagonist? One of um, our casting director um, put up um, posters all around uh, Afghan markets in Toronto. Um, it was a co-production, so we have to uh, you have to spend your money in Ireland and Luxembourg or Canada. We were under uh, strictures on uh, in how we could. Um, where we could spend our money and how, uh, so it was also, I suppose, a, a low-budget film. So we just, we just had lots of lots of people come in to try out for the part, and Sarah Shadri came in, and um, it was really just the case. There was just one really um, piranha. She was 11 years old, um, but she could go places with her performance. I usually just pretend I work here. If you look like you believe it, then they will too. See, <laughs> we're cleaners. You know, again, when you think of a booth, which is, you know, dark, you just have a, a microphone and I would uh, stand in uh, with her. And um, she was just able to take everything on, but then shake it off at the end of the day, you know? She was just an incredible actor. So, yeah. Kyle, in Despicable Me 3, you had Steve Crow playing a dual role this time because yeah. we met uh, Gru's brother, Drew. So tell us about the decision to have him voice both brothers and how did you kind of shape the second one so that they weren't exactly the same? Well, it, there was no question that from the beginning that he was going to voice Drew because he brought so much to, to Gru and, and just trying to f figure out like who is who's this alter ego of, of Gru, like what's the other side of this personality. Um, and you know what could give a nice contrast and, and sense of appeal to it. So um, you know he did so much to kind of sculpt this other persona that is like the polar opposite of, of who Gru is. Gru is really curmudgeonly and and uh, really gruff about everything. And Drew is is really sunshiny guy and, and just very kind of bombastic and dynamic. It was just this nice juxtaposition between these two, you know. Um, so, so Steve really fleshed that out. And then I don't think there's any other way that we could have ever had that scene where the two brothers are, are try, pretending to be each other and they're, yeah. and they're trying to, you know, bring out the best and worst qualities of each other's character um, if it hadn't come through Steve. And Alec Baldwin as the boss baby, how did oh, that yeah. happen? You know, it, it's interesting. I, I, I love what Lee was saying just before Alec, you know, um, you know, doing child authenticity in a voice is very difficult. And then we had the same sim uh, similar situation where Miles Bakshi came in to do Scratch voice and he was so authentic. And we went through the casting process to listen to hundreds of kids, but they, d they didn't feel as real as uh, Miles did. And so it's just like, you got the part, you know? And uh, the problem was, it took five years when we started. I think he ended up, he started when he was 10, he ended as 15. And his voice did change. And we had to like pitch it up a little bit. And luckily we had recorded so many versions, we were able to like get what we needed. But it was very difficult with, because animation takes forever. With Boss Baby and Marla Frazee's book, for me, I connected very personally with it, because I had lived it with my brother. And, and I thought like, uh, there was a, you know, this relationship, you know, you think of the character first and then, and then you find, once the character is pretty solidified, you want to go, well, who would be the best voice for this character? What have you learned about puppies? Hey, puppy! No, Jimbo, puppies are evil. Stacy, read back the notes. I can't read. What's it say? This is my team, a muscle head, a bunch of yes men, and a doodler? Exactly! Put that cookie down. Cookies are for closers. I think hands down, Marla Frazee emailed Jeffrey Katzenberg, myself, and producer Ramsey Nido all said Alec Baldwin. I mean, it's just one of those, felt like a no-brainer in a way. And, and part of it for me is when I talked to him about it, he had great insight on it because he had lived it with his brothers. And it was all sibling rivalry, and he connected it with it. And so that was the selling point, you know? And he, he likes to improvise. I worked with him before. And so you know he always brings more than what's on the page. Now, in, in his case, as you pointed out, it takes a long time to make these movies. Now, during the course of making Boss Baby, uh, Alex started playing Donald Trump on SNL. 
and then Donald Trump won the presidency. And I know. That happened just a few months before the movie came out. So with that in mind, what were the internal conversations about that and did that impact the marketing at all? To me, I just see Alec, he, he, he's a master impersonator and he does a great De Niro and he does a great Trump and he does, and you know, this is, we'd finished the movie before the elections really came out. So it was kind of a surprise to us, you know, and it's just like, well, Alec's out there doing his thing, you know, and if, but in no means was it, it was saying we're telling a movie about baby Trump in, in a way, because we get that a lot. <laughs> but it was funny because like during press tours, everyone in Russia thought it was a movie about Putin. So it's like, <laughs> believe what you want to believe, you know, I guess. But if you look at it, it's a little bit different. So it's interesting because, you know, when you bring up a great point. When you start these things like six years ago, five years ago, you never know what's going to be going on in the world at any time and you can be you can for better or for worse you can fall into something you know that you can never foresee you know and whether you know you like the president or not you know it's interesting that was the farthest thing from our mind in making the movie and then Alec is just gonna do what he he does you know yeah. well because these take so long to make I uh, when is it when is it pencils down I mean ha have you had to ever make a very last-minute change on any of your movies I remember back on Monsters, Inc., you know, we were posting Monsters, Inc. when 9-11 happened, and we had a few moments in that film that felt, uh, you know, under the circumstances, not quite right anymore. And so we did do a, a mad scramble there at the end to completely redo a scene just because it just it wasn't sitting with us quite right. So it does happen now and then. Mm -hmm. The rest of you? The, yeah, I, my movie, uh, we, we basically started two and a half years before we released it, we had no script, and we we did it in two and a half years. So we were constantly finishing <laughs> this movie as it was uh, making its way towards the release date. We had kind of a crazy schedule, so I was we were I was constantly tweaking the movie up until I mean I was doing animation in December um, for a movie that was released on February 10th. So um, yeah, it's we we were down to the wire. For sure. With the opening fairly close to Batman v Superman mm -hmm. coming out, were there any decisions or discussions made about the relationship between those films? Uh, you know, we I, we definitely made some people uncomfortable at Warner Brothers, and uh, you know, <laughs> uh, there was conversations about you know jokes that we had in there, and 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 uh, whether you know whether Zack Snyder, or Christopher Nolan, uh, we we you know we made a joke about Iron Man sucks. Um, and had to go, you know, make sure the Marvel was okay and that sort of thing. Yeah, there's quite a few. And, and the fact that we also had a lot of characters from other properties from outside of, we had Warner Brothers characters, but we had characters from outside too, so I kept the lawyers real busy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for, for that, for in the original Lego, though, there were a lot of characters. What, what was it about the Batman that you decided that was the one you wanted to do the, the standalone for? I, what I pitched the studio is that I wanted to do Jerry Maguire as directed by Michael Mann with a lot of Batman jokes in it. And the, the treatment was, uh, was Seth Graham Smith and Chris and Phil and, and I, to a certain extent, wrote a, a, a good treatment that the studio liked. And um, it was very clear that that should be the next movie that we did. And, and Will Arnett's version of Batman was, was something we all wanted to play with and play in that world. So it made a lot of sense for that to be the next the next movie. Um, uh, and so, so yeah, that's why we, we sort of just took off. And Kyle, what about for you? What were uh, the decisions about, you know, starting this next sequel? What were you looking to do? Uh, mostly we're looking to, you know, we've seen Gru go from being like a super villain to, to a dad uh, in the first Despicable Me. And then in the second one, he becomes a husband. And that we wanted to go deeper into him finding, you know, his long lost brother and connecting with, with his family in this sense. But also, you know, things have been going so well for Gru. He, he started working for the Anti-Villain League. All these things started happening in, in his, his romantic life, his family life. And we were asking ourselves what would happen if we took all that away from him. He, you know, he got fired. He gets humiliated. He, he has to go connect with his, his roots and, and go deeper into, you know, where he came from to kind of refine himself and refine his mojo, you know. Um, that was one of the main the main ideas that we were playing with. For the rest of you, Lee, for example, um, when you're finishing Coco, is is sequel on people's minds? Are there things that you're putting in there to set up a sequel? Or? No. Um, I mean, we rarely do that. I mean, we just hope that we make something that resonates with people. And, um, you know, sometimes the movies take on a life of their own mm -hmm. afterwards. But at this point, we, you know, we've just tried to tell a really solid standalone story. So. That's, that's all we're really thinking about right now. 
Laurie, you're, you're nodding. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. I think we're, we're always so fortunate that we get to make a movie, period, that we actually can see it through and that it gets released and the studio's behind it and it's marketed. And, and so when it gets to the theater, and, and all you're worried about really is finishing it and doing something that you hope people will like. Anything beyond that, if, if, if people love it, like, on, you know, and you get to do a second one, it's just, it's, it's icing on the cake, really. It's, um, but I don't think you ever start out thinking, well, this is going to be a franchise or a sequel. You kind of hope, maybe in the back of your mind, maybe they'll like it enough and there will be more. But I don't think we ever, we ever intend on doing that. In the case of Boss Baby? Yeah, it was difficult with that movie. I was thinking about it because a lot of people go, oh, you're setting up a sequel at the end because if you haven't seen the movie, there's this moment where there's this other little baby in a suit. And to me, it felt sad to think like this was all in this kid's imagination. I think kids wanted to think it was real. Is it real? Is it not? And that's where it's kind of inception for kids is the top still spinning at the end of the movie. And they felt like, yay, it is real because we had this moment with this little baby at the end of the film with a, with a suit on, you know? And it, but I think like a lot of, and kids loved it and a lot of parents are going, oh, you're setting up for a sequel. It's like, well, no, you never know, you know, uh, like Lori said, you know, how these things are gonna go and you can't have the hubris to go, oh yeah, we're gonna do, we're not gonna do two, we're gonna jump right to three and just go right to there. So it's like, you just hope your little baby goes out and does well and then start thinking where to, I think everyone here could probably say you do fall in love with your characters yeah. you're working with and, sure. and you want to do more with them, but that's up to mm -hmm. everyone, the audience, you know, wise. Well, that's you... one of the great opportunities about doing a sequel is that, you know, you get to, to put these characters that you fall in love with into different new situations and see what they do and see how they overcome different challenges and, and they, they just start to, to flesh out even, even further. As far as sequels go, you also, of course, did the Madagascar films, and you did some popular voice work. You voiced Skipper the Penguin. Oh, no. <laughs> it's been so long. Where's my macchiato? <laughs> um, which actually came in hand. Doing voice work was interesting for me because, uh, A, I could pull it out in a meeting, even with Jeffrey, and it just sounds authoritative. So it's like, <laughs> we need three million more dollars. What do you say, chief? <laughs> and then it, you'd say no, but it's still like you'd at least listen to. But uh, doing voice work was really interesting for me because, you know, uh, I learned a lot about directing by being on that part of the, behind the mic. And how much, how nude you are and how naked you are, you don't know context-wise what's going on or anything. And so it's really a leap of faith. And when you do a performance, you really aren't aware of it, you know. And so you need the feedback. And it taught me to be a better director, just like knowing, you know, even just giving actors context of what's going on it, it, to, to detail, you know, and um, never do a line read. That was a big thing because as soon as you, being on that side of it, uh, whenever you get a line read, it's like I could have given you 10 different versions of that line, but now I just have this version okay. that you just said to me in your head. So, so I learned a lot of lessons doing it. I'd rather be on the other side of the <laughs> mic, though, because it's it's fun working with but you actors did, better than you yourself. You did squeak one voice in to Boss Baby. I did. I played a chef, I think, because uh, a, a Julia Childs type chef. And uh, and it was kind of a last minute Hail Mary being put into the film, so I just ran up and, and did my worst Julia Childs <laughs> <laughs> and it ended up in the movie. And uh, yeah. No, Lee and Chris, you both started as editors, and mm -hmm. you're both also still very involved in the editing process on your films. How does how does that experience inform your decisions as a director? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I started as an editor way back when, right out of film school, and um, and I started at Pixar as an editor, cutting the first two films that I worked on. Um, I don't. Know, I mean, I I've always felt like editing is like second only to directing. I mean, in terms of somebody really having a hand in shaping what the what the finished film is going to feel like. I just I can't imagine directing a film without cutting it as well. I know there are a lot of directors out there that don't cut their own films, and power to them. But um, I just really I, I need to be in the cutting room, um, just steeping myself in the film and all of its millions of problems and. There's something about just locking yourself away and uh, and really having the time to think and 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 go deep to to solve problems. I know I've solved a lot of problems in ways that I never could have if I was just having to show up at a meeting and and kind of you know off the cuff come up with a solution. And Chris, yeah, m much to the chagrin of the editors that I work with, uh, mm -hmm. I, I sometimes get on the machine and and help out. Um, 
I think in animation in particular, it's a it's a really useful skill because um, I, I, I the method that I've on on both the Lego the first Lego and, and on Batman, I, I wanted to get the boards in as quickly as possible because I think that's the best way to be able to give feedback. I don't I don't actually like to sort of sit there and look at boards and, and pitch boards and stuff like that. Uh, I, I like to get it in the system, take the pages, get somebody to voice it, um, put sound effects to it, music to it. I, I, I want to try to get as many of us as possible um, to feel the movie as quickly as possible. So I, I, I want I want to have that experience and, and I think you know I think it, I think that way then I can get everybody, we can all start talking and analyzing the patient on the table um, uh, in, in a way where we're not sort of in our heads and, and we're actually looking at what works and what doesn't work as, as, as clearly as we possibly can get. So I try to bring everything in and so having that, having that skill, sometimes I gotta pitch in and help out or you know, help people sort of like see what's a, what's a, um, what's a new way of trying to uh, uh, get to this material because you're constantly sort of responding to all of these stimulus. You're responding to the boards, you're responding to some piece of art, you're responding to something that somebody did as a scratch actor or the real actor. And then what? And then kind of the the you know prejudices, prejudices and assumptions that the that the editor is making. To me, that's uh, that's kind of why I think it's it's important to sort of have that skill when you're mm -hmm. working in animation. I've often heard it said that uh, you know live action is shoot first then edit and animation is the reverse. It's almost edit first and then mm -hmm. do the production. So how does that impact your process? Well, certainly for me, uh, sitting at the edit myself, I sit with a microphone as well and I polish dialogue as I go. Um, with The Breadwinner we had um, just one storyboard artist for the first pass of the whole film because I wanted to get a certain sensibility and a sensitivity into it. So I'd worked with a um, a, a filmmaker um, who had uh, produced his own short film uh, with uh, Cartoon Saloon and had storyboarded on Song of the Sea, so I knew we were aligned. So that's how we worked. He just worked really roughly, and uh, I would take it in uh, to Ava just for that first pass, and then I could bring in an editor and have those discussions with an editor. But with a film like this, um, with an independent film, everything is one shot. So even with our voice actors, we pretty much had to get 90% of the material in one go. Um, because again, we were talking you know, about studios across the world from each other. So the more I can ingest and internalize, the more then when it comes to a later stage and an animator has a great idea, I know whether that's in line with the movie that we're making or not. Um, so, so all that, that time initially is just about having a quiet place to make that first layer of the movie and then everything gets built on top of that. Now, Angelina Jolie came on as executive as an executive producer of The Breadwinner. How did that come about, and what? Uh, how did you work with her? Two of our executive producers, uh, uh, Jahan Nujem and Karima Amir, um, who made a, a live-action documentary called The Square about the revolution in, in Egypt or the uprising in Egypt, managed to get the, the, an early draft of the screenplay uh, in front of her, and uh, we had some concept uh, artwork done, and uh, she read the script and looked at the artwork and and signed on, basically. So um, so I pretended that I was in town on business and I hopped on a plane just so that I could, you know, <laughs> turn up at a meeting. Um, and yeah, I, honestly, it was like a continuation of a, of a conversation rather than the start of one. She knew exactly what we were attempting to do with that, uh, with the film. And what was interesting because the, the, the novel that uh, the, the, the film is based on was published in 2000. And I was very mindful of the time period that had passed between 2000 and 2014, where we, we started making the movie. Um, and so was she, you know. Um, so, so it was interesting to try and tell a f the story of a film, knowing what we know now, but a film that was based, you know, over a decade and a half ago, I guess, and, and trying to understand all the grey areas, I think, um, and to keep a film, keep it universal, I think. These are all things that she was really guided and helped uh, with all through the, the process. She did. Now, a animation really can be used to tell any type of story, but subjects such as the one that uh, The Breadwinner is based on um, tend to be made more on the independent world. Why do you think that is? We find uh, studios around the world, I think, that, that have a passion for storytelling, but um, want to make stories that don't ordinarily get put out in front of uh, young audiences or family audiences or uh, older children. Um, so 
with the breadwinner, we worked with a co-producer in Luxembourg who had worked on Song of the Sea. We worked with aircraft pitchers in, in uh, Toronto. But it, it, we had aligned sensibilities. We didn't have the same skill set, but we had aligned sensibilities. Things like the, the Irish Film Board, the tax break that we have in Ireland, the same with Luxembourg, their the film fund and uh, the, the film fund in, in, in Canada, Telefilm, allow different stories uh, to be told stories about you know flawed characters but living in extraordinary circumstances that you're just not used to seeing there's a freedom in that there's a there, you're left alone as well which is in it to a to a degree you're left alone you don't have somebody breathing down your neck making sure that they want to get their investment back i think it was th there was a really interesting process where our, our actors helped inform the story when we got into animatic we sent it out to afghan consultants who gave a lot of feedback um, and we were able to adapt uh, to that feedback, but we didn't have, we didn't have that that that, that fear, you know, <laughs> um, that that comes with um, a massive injection of, of of money from one source. I think so, because they can be made. I think is the answer to that. I think that that stories like the breadwinner and films like the breadwinner can be made with a, you know, this international kind of independent model because we can. For the rest of you, are there some types of stories that are considered too risky for the studio system? What do you find? I think the studio definitely wants to make films for family, for, for you know, all ages. And they don't want to, um, you know, they don't want, they want mothers to feel comfortable taking their children, their young kids to the movies and not have to explain things to them or be uncomfortable by it. So we kind of keep that in mind. But at the same time, we're trying to make movies that appeal to adults as well and, and so that adults can go see them with or without children. So it's, it's, we're walking a fine lines. But there are things that you have to keep in mind. And is the humor too edgy? Does it push the boundaries um, a little bit too far? Um, is it a subject matter that we really need to tame a little bit more? Hopefully, um, children can learn from something that, 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 that's a little bit above their heads, but you do have to uh, walk that line, and especially for studios who make family films. What about the rest of you and your experiences? I don't think Lego Movie you had to, work, it's you hard had to, to go worry like about you that, did you? For kids or <laughs> yeah. adults, you know, it's, it's like you really have to go from your heart in a way. And, and, you know, I've worked on movies that weren't as personal, but when you get into a personal story you're trying to tell, and, and it's kind of a universal thing, sibling rivalry. So everyone that came to the film had a story to tell. And you invite people to tell their story and their version of it. And I think innately, the hope was that kids are seeing it through the kids' point of view of getting a new baby brother or sister, and the adults are watching it as parents looking how silly their kids are acting. And so it just felt like, you know, because that question comes up a lot. Do you aim for kids or do you aim for adults? And if you just got to go, maybe we're all arrested developments when it comes to kid humor, but um, you, you can't really go, this is a movie for kids. You just kind of got to go from your gut and hope it plays to everybody, I think, you know. That's for the studio to worry about. You know, and, and then sometimes when you preview a movie and someone mm -hmm. objects to something, it depends on how many people object to it, you know, or the kids like it or the parents don't. It kind of gets into this gray area, and, and that's where you have to really stand up and go, like, it's fine. No one, you know, treat, treat kids like adults and, you know, uh, and, and let them react to things. I'm sure even if the subject matter is, is stronger than a commercial movie, it's like kids need to learn this stuff, they need to experience life, and there's, I don't think any animated movie that's really gonna truly scar anybody for, mm. you know, I don't think. Yeah, Watership I mean, Down. <laughs> Watership Down, you're right about that, you're right. I found that we've had a few films where um, there were moments that maybe parents thought were too intense for kids, <clears> and <throat> I found in every case, the kids are fine. Mm -hmm. You know, I, usually those situations... Could you give us an example of one well, of those? Well, like, say, at the end of Toy Story 3, the, the whole incinerator scene. Mm -hmm. um, there were people that just thought that was just way too intense. And what I found with my own kids and talking to a lot of other kids who saw the film was that they were fine with it. I think mm -hmm. what happens is that when adults feel strong emotions, they naturally want to protect their children mm -hmm. from, from feeling yeah. those strong mm -hmm. feelings. Mm -hmm. But the kids, I found, by and large, are, are, are actually capable of, of dealing with it, and it's actually good for them. It's, I mean, that's why we go see movies, right? Mm -hmm. to, to experience strong feelings that maybe we wouldn't feel in our day-to-day -day life, and it's, it's just another way of kind of processing yeah. all of that. I have to agree with that completely, because that's, that's been our experience, too, when we do test screenings, and then you get back parents saying one thing and the kids saying, no, I didn't feel that at all. So you really do get the fact that the kids are, are fine with it. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, I 
prefer to make movies that make people, that, you know, that move people and make them feel emotions and whatever. And I don't, I think that children are, are, are great to be, you know, are, they're so much better off if they can feel yeah. those emotions. I mean, we have an interesting situation with Coco now because death is a part of the story. I mean, it's just intrinsic right. to the story. The, the movie is not about death, it's about family. Right. Um, but and it, the theme is the, the day of the But dead. it's set against Dia de los right. Muertos, and um, you know, so death is a part of the story. But, um, I don't know, the way I, I we're all gonna die someday, mm -hmm. right? It's something that you know, maybe people wanna push away and not think about, but um, I think it's good to have things, uh, to tell stories that do kind of deal with these subjects mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. in simple ways or ways that, you know, where it's not facing it head on. But um, at the end of the day, we're telling, we're just telling a story, we're telling right. a family story, mm -hmm. but, it, but, but there are elements in it that, um, you know, may be a bit challenging, but, mm -hmm. uh, I think challenging this, in a good way. I think the same with Ferdinand. I mean, Ferdinand is a story about a bull who won't fight. He's not like all other bulls, and of course, he's going to take a ribbing for it. He's going to get teased about it. He's going to be pushed to be like everybody else. And I think that's the 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 the, 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 the takeaway from this movie is is very much that you have to be who you are. And Ferdinand fights to be who he is throughout the entire movie. And by just by virtue of being himself, he changes everyone around him. And it's a it's a really wonderful story. I think it will appeal to adults as well as kids. And it's, you know, it's, I think it's, it, there, the bullying aspect or the, the teasing aspect is something that maybe some people might feel uncomfortable from time to time, but, you know, it's such a prevalent part of our lives. I mean, it's just all around us. And I think giving kids, you know, an opportunity to see that they don't have to, you know, kowtow to, they don't have to, you know, take what a bully gives them, that they are strong in who, themselves, who they are if they just stand up for who they are. I think that's a really good message for kids. So I think that, I think children, I think kids will get, get the adult version of that as well. In, in the case of Ferdinand, um, it, it's based on a book, but uh, Disney also made a animated, an animated short about Ferdinand back in 1938. Um, to what extent did you reference that? Um, personally, I never even saw the short, I must say. I mean, the book is something I'm very fond of and I've always been fond of. I never saw the short, so I really can't speak to that. But they didn't, I, I don't believe our, our directors, I mean, they may have been aware of it, but I think we took the book and I think the difficult part about making Ferdinand, especially for Carlos Saldana, our director, was it's got a beautiful act one and a beautiful act three, but there's no act two. And so he had to create this act two. We had to find, you know, the, the story, Ferdinand's journey and who all the characters are and we've created some really funny, fun, endearing, lovable characters along the way for him and 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 I so I, I don't know that the um, that the short really figured into what we were doing. Often Hollywood has created characters of uh, I'm Speedy Gonzalez as an example. How careful were you to avoid stereotypes when you were making your movie Lee? Um, I first pitched what became Coco six years ago this month. And, um, and John Lasseter, I, I pitched him three different ideas and John immediately sparked to doing a film set against Dia de los Muertos. And the moment that he gave the thumbs up, I thought, oh my gosh, what have I done? Because I, I realized immediately I, I had a huge responsibility on my shoulders to tell the story right, to be respectful, to be accurate. It was our goal from the very beginning of this project to not ever, ever fall into cliches or stereotypes. And um, we did that in a number of ways. We, uh, you know, we, we made a commitment to hiring an all Latino cast from the very beginning. Um, and then we surrounded ourselves with a bunch of cultural experts. We had three core people um, uh, that we worked with. Uh, and then we also um, had a number of screenings for uh, different Latino groups um, of folks from all different walks of life, politicians, media people, um, artists, uh, playwrights, to watch what we were doing in a way that we, we had never lifted the veil before on any of our other films. I mean, usually we're, we're so secret about what we're making and it's just the people within the studio that are ever seeing it. But in the case of Coco, pretty much every three months we try to screen the films and we would bring people in from the outside. And for me as a director it was really painful, right, because early on you, you, know, you don't know what you're doing yet, you, you haven't found your story, yet we were, you know, I was having to show it to folks. But it ended up being just a vital part of the process because not only did we end up getting, um, you know, the details really 
uh, accurate, but it, but the, the ideas that they gave us and the comments that they made ended up shaping the characters of the film and shaping the story that we told. There were things that we discovered that we never would have discovered had we not surrounded ourselves with folks. Could you give us an yeah, example? Yeah, for instance, um, in, in talking with a lot of experts on Dia de los Muertos, we learned about this idea um, that there's a belief that we're all capable of dying multiple deaths, that you have a, an initial death when your heart stops. There's another kind of death when you're buried and nobody can see you anymore. But, but then the kind of the, the most poignant death is this final death, this idea that when there's nobody left in the world who remembers you, hmm. when, when nobody remembers you anymore, you die this final death. And the moment that I heard that story, I, I knew that we just had to make that the bedrock of the story that we're telling, and we did. It's just a, it's a, if we had never found that, I, you know, we would have been telling a very different story, and I don't know if it, the, the, the story would have had the, the impact that I, I hope Coco does for people. Mm -hmm. Um, online uh, already, <laughs> um, th there have been some comments about uh, the stories are obviously different, but that you are doing a story that has a Day of the Dead theme where Book of Life similarly did a few years ago. And we had Jorge on this roundtable mm -hmm. a few years ago. Um, how do you respond to comments like that? You know, we were about a year into Coco when we found out that Book of Life was being made. And my first reaction was honestly one of dismay, and I wanted to pull the plug on what we were doing because um, I knew that no matter what we did, that we would always be compared to that film and would be seen as not as original, uh, which was upsetting to me because when I first thought of the idea, I, I did a lot of research and I discovered that there had been no story set against Dia de los Muertos told in animation or live action in the entire history of cinema. And so I felt like what we were doing was fiercely original. So when I saw that um, Book of Life was being made, um, I was really worried about it. And what I was worried about is actually happening now because uh, I think to some degree we are seen as less original. But when, when uh, Book of Life came out uh, and I saw it, it was a great film and thankfully it was a very different story than the story that we knew we were telling. And subsequently I've gotten to know Jorge, we've gotten to be good friends and uh, he's been super supportive of what we're up to. I mean, his attitude, as is mine, is there doesn't need to be one Christmas movie. You know, we can tell lots of stories set against this, uh, this celebration. It's a beautiful celebration, and um, I'm, I'm, I feel honored to be, you know, hopefully, educating the world more about it. And um, uh, let's, let's tell more beautiful stories set against uh, me Mexican culture, because it's a beautiful country filled with beautiful people. What about the rest of you? Well, actually, let's talk about Ferdinand. Um, you said you, your team went to Spain to do some um, research. <clears throat> uh, Carlos, our director, our production designer, and my producing partner went to Spain. But they, they went, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't research as much as it was um, to, get, to get inspiration. And they went there to look around, look at the environments, to see how they can be inspired to, to capture the spirit of Spain. They wanted to pay homage to Spain. And at the same time, they wanted to um, create environments that that make you feel like you're in Spain. So they did. They did. You know, they. I think they had a really good time actually when they went, um, as most people do when they go to foreign countries on trips like this. But um, even um, Tom Cardone, our production designer, actually would find places that he just set up his easel and paint. He's a wonderful painter, and so he would just have all these wonderful images of Spain that he would, you know, um, bring back and show us. And of course, there were always these the fun photographs of them you know, making fun of each other <laughs> in the streets of Spain. But it was, um, yes, they, they really sort of uh, got their inspiration from that trip. Let's go around the table. Favorite character in your film and why? Hmm. I think my favorite character um, is, the, is a character called Razak, who's a Talib, but he is a wise man and a kind man. There's a kindness to him and a depth to him. And I think if anything, he shows that nothing is black and white, that you, everybody has depth, everybody is somebody's mother, somebody's son, somebody's husband, you know. And um, the performance by Kawa Ada, who's a, a, a young Afghan actor who just brought such wonderful depth to this character and a warmth to his performance. So even, you know, in what seemed like throwaway lines, he, he infused it with, with such understanding, I think, of his own culture and his own history and the future of his, his culture and his, his country as well. And I, yeah, you could feel that in his performance. And I, I think that's probably why Razak is my favorite character in, in The Breadwinner. Okay, Chris? 
Uh, I probably identify with Batman, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, Michael Sarah as, as Dick Grayson, Robin, was t my favorite character in the movie. Uh, he's so indefatigable and positive and uh, charming and happy and, and just, you know, has, uh, just sees the world, you know, in, in such a, a, you know, joyous way in Michael Sarah's performance. He was so giving and so much fun and playful and just every day uh, brought something really unique and, and, and fun and um, uh, I just, you know, I, I fall in love with that character all the time and so I think it's, it's even though I think I'm probably a lot more like Will Arnett <laughs> and Batman, um, Michael Cera is Robin for sure. Lee? Whenever we get that question, it's like asking us which is our favorite kid, right? right? Mm -hmm. It's a hard one. but. Um, in the case of Coco, I mean, Miguel, the main character, will always hold a special place in my heart. You know, he's a kid who is passionate about something that his family just doesn't allow. Um, but he's in a tough situation because he loves his family very much. It's not a matter of just running away from his family to pursue his dreams. You know, he wants to figure out how to navigate both, how to have the love of his family and how to be with his family, but at the same time try, try to convince them somehow to accept him for, for who he is what he is. It's hard for me to separate Miguel from Anthony Gonzalez, the, the boy who plays him. Uh, I, I almost don't know where one ends and the other begins. He, he just brought such life to the character and he was such a joy to work with. You know, he's, he was 10 years old when we started working with him and he just turned 13. And um, he, I, I just, I couldn't have found a more mature, kind, loving, I mean, he, every, every recording session started and ended with him hugging everybody in the room. <laughs> He's just a, an awesome kid. He started singing at Olivera Plaza when he was a little boy. And anyway, I, I'm telling you all this about Anthony because all of what is Anthony is Miguel as well in the film. And um, I think people really fall in love with him. Kyle. Well, the Despicable Me universe is one of the big themes is about villains. And um, my favorite character in Despicable Me 3 is Balthazar Bratt, uh, sure. mainly because of just the way that he evolved out of this uh, this idea of a, a child star who his show gets canceled because he, he, he grows into adolescence and he never quite gets over that so he like just embodies the, the villain that he played on TV and he tries to, to relive that in his adult life. Uh, but personally just because I'm a child of the 80s and, and that he's so stuck in the 80s and all of his references are about that, everything about his, his persona is based in that. And, um, and then on top of that just the performance that Trey Parker gave us and how much he played with his character and, and this us the singing and the you know the, all the ideas that he gave us for the this great like kind of dancey um, kind of lost boy you know, that, that Brad is so Laurie well again because Ferdinand is the lead of the of this book and um, we have some great um, characters that he has relationships with but I think I think Ferdinand has to be my favorite character in this movie because he's I mean not only the lead but he he's just overcome so much and takes so much just to be able to live the life that he feels that that is his and again because he will stay himself through no matter what situation um, is, is thrown his way he he, he just is who he is. He's, he can't be anything else. He doesn't want to be anything else. His life would be so much easier if he could be like everyone else. Um, and, and they tell him this, but he doesn't understand. He, does, he just wants to be who he is. He wants to smell the flowers. He wants to have a happy life. He wants to um, be accepted for who he is, not what he looks like. And I think, um, as I mentioned before, I think the thing that really resonates with me is here's a character who is, is put in bad situation after bad situation and, and is, is looking at, at, at possibly the worst situation and yet still refuses to give in and allow himself to be what everyone per perceives him to be. And, and in doing so, just the simple profoundness of that is that he tends to change everybody around him and he stays the same. And it's a wonderful, um, he's a wonderful character and I think as you said about your character, your actor embodies the character. I think obviously John Cena just embodies Ferdinand. He is Ferdinand. I just, you see him and you see Ferdinand you know, behind the muscles in his heart. So, and oh well, you know, I'd I'd say Alec in case he's listening. But and <laughs> he, gave, he gave so much, uh, like fifty recording sessions, which was insane, and we had such a great time. But my heart goes to Tim Templeton because um, I was the boss baby in my family, and my older brother, who I I tortured my life, <laughs> it was really. Uh, 
the kid, the older brother. And um, for me, my goal in this movie was to a do a apology a letter to my brother for making his life so miserable all these years. And you know, we came out the other side great friends. And and so, but when you're dealing with a seven year old who's kind of the main protagonist, you know, that's that's where the heart comes from. And um, I think you know, it was really fun to play with a seven year old's imagination because that's. You can really, you know, when you, as you get older, you forget what it was like to be an imaginative kid. I think Dr. Sh or Ted Geisel had a, a great quote about, um, you know, adults being obsolete children. And so, uh, to me, like, you could really put the art, the imagination into this one character. And, and, uh, and it was my brother, and so the joy was at the premiere to, like, sit next to my brother and see if I could make him cry. <laughs> which, uh, which he did, so I feel like mission accomplished. <laughs>
we, the film didn't need it. The film started talking to, to, to you or me and just saying, you know, it doesn't want this. It wants to get here sooner. And so you just, even though you love bits of it, you can tear it off. Sometimes a little bit of there may end up here, but you know, uh, um, you have to make those choices, and sometimes they're really hard choices to make. You know, and, okay. and to me, the, the ending was the most important thing. That's the thing that needed to be protected, okay. and so it was really about how to, does it work with that. We're, we're getting a little tight on time, but there were a few other things I wanted to get to. Um, importantly, Lori and Nora, could you talk about what it's like being a woman working in the business? I've always worked in cartoon saloons, so nearly 20 years, I guess, and I've always been ahead of the studio. Um, so when I had my my two boys, I would I would wheel them in beside me, and you know they would, you know, make noise and uh, annoy all the animators and that. So in a way, I've had I've been in a bubble, I suppose, so to speak. Uh, we always had a, a very open atmosphere in our in our studio towards families and that. Um, I do think a lot of the problem with, uh, and I wouldn't even push it down to just talking about women because I think it affects children, it affects fathers, you know, in, in, in animation as well. And I do think we have to change the the whole way we look at um, animation production. I, I think it's, it's just not realistic for line producers to think that, you know, you can work seven days a week, you know, or expect people to work seven days a week, uh, 24 hours a day, and kill yourself in a production and then, um, and then start again, you know. I think that we have to be really realistic about how much time is healthy for people to, to spend on a, on a production. Um, because otherwise we won't attract women into animation, I think, into, into the, the director's roles, you know, in animation. Um, you know, anybody who wants to have any kind of a balance in their life are not going to um, be attracted into, into directing. And there are so few women directors in animation. Why is that, do you think? You know, it, I, I, have, I have had um, a really great experience working in animation as a woman. I have not come across any problems that people are talking about today out in, out in the industry. I mean, it just, it feels like everything has gone smoothly for me. Everyone has been wonderful. I haven't, I haven't had any problems like that, and I don't have children, so I didn't, I didn't have that, that, that time, you know, constraint. But I, I, but you're right. I do notice. I mean, obviously, it's 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 everybody knows this. There's just not a lot of women directors. There's not a lot of women producers. There are a lot of women executives in the studios. But there's just there's just they're just not coming to the creative positions. So I'm not sure I know the reason why there are no um, women, not not enough women directors or producers or line producers or, or or animators. I mean, there clearly are majority. The majority are men. But I. I I, I'm stymied to know whether you know whether it's yeah. the time constraints that you have family life and you can't take off the time if, if that's part of the it's problem. A, it's a different, is it is it, it the men that are, are are hiring just men or is it the women hiring men and do they? I'm not quite a, sure. There's a different type of encouragement needed, I think, and certainly on uh, the breadwinner, I noticed that I was using women in certain departments where I knew they could do the job brilliantly, but I also knew there was a, a level above that where they could also move into, but. Uh, they knew and I knew to hold things together. I'd like them to stay in that role, you know, uh, which is terrible and I shouldn't do that and they shouldn't do that, you know, we should make sure that, that people can move up um, and, and, uh, and feel the pain, the production pain and your film mightn't be as good because you've, you've made a hole down here and you've moved somebody up here, you know. Um, so that kind of encouragement, I think, is, is necessary. I think that, I know, again, just, just to, to use an example of, of asking uh, uh, um, one of the, the women I work with to do something that was just outside of, you know, her, her job description, and she felt she wouldn't do a, a good job with it, but I was pressed for time. I asked her to, to please do it anyway, and she did an, a magnificent job. You know, so sometimes I have guys working on my team who might convince me otherwise, you know, and mightn't do such a great job. It's a, they're, they're all, I think there's lots of different answers to that question. Um, For the rest of you, do you make an effort to hire diverse crews? Is that something that's <clears throat> well, on your mind? Well, it's absolutely been a priority at Pixar uh, lately. I mean, we have a number of extremely talented uh, women working in animation and in story and we are doing everything we can to give them opportunities to rise up to make sure that they're mentored properly to give them opportunities to direct shorts uh, to pitch their ideas because we know that there's an imbalance and we we want to fix it unfortunately it's it's hard when a, the timeline of a film is you know can be five years it's hard to get that that ball rolling but we're doing everything that we can to try to get more female voices and, uh, and just voices from different backgrounds um, we've telling always, stories. 
Sorry, we've always looked for female because we <clears throat> want to, we, I mean, the balance between female and, and male in, in our departments, especially story and animation and everything, um, is, is, is really crucial. But we haven't been able to find as many women who are out there either looking they're, to they're come coming, to us. They're coming. They're coming. I think, like, when you do publicity, you get to the benefit of going to a lot of schools. And there are a lot of animation schools now. And when I went to CalArts, this is like mid-'80s, there was, like, maybe three girls out of a class mm -hmm. of 30. Mm -hmm. And so when you go to like Ringling or, the, or, or San Francisco uh, School Academy of Arts, especially, it's not like 50%. Or beyond. Sometimes or beyond. Like yeah, exactly what you're saying. And this girl, uh, this young lady showed me this film she had done on her phone, not on, showed me on her phone, you know, at this eight minute project. And you're going, you're so, a director, yeah. you're, you, you know, and I think like, um, you know, the industry has grown so much. Personally, I've worked with women as partners, as producing partners, under women as heads of studios and, and so and and production designers lighting and the most talented people you know. So I feel like I'm in a bubble and the rest of the <laughs> world is obviously not. But it's encouraging to say like now they have there's role models, you know, that people can look up to, like Kathleen Kennedy's and Stacy Snyder's and all these people that can run studios and they can go, Wow, I can do it too and I think maybe that's just drawing more and more people in and hopefully this next generation will mm -hmm keep building on that you know I think it's important to, you got to hire people and and find those people and search for those people give them a seat at the table somehow um, give them a coordinator job giving them give them a, a job where they they can be a part of the process and watch what you go through so that they can you know they can meet the studio head so that they so that they can you know see all of the pain of, of how the how the process uh, you know works because I think what's important about that is, because um, we have a diversity problem in general, I think what's important about that is um, you, we, we don't have a good mechanism for when people fail. We, 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 we uh, you, know, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a lot of straight white guys get a second, third, fifth chance, but you know, a kid like Matty Rich, who makes, you know, straight out of Brooklyn, you know, he gets one other chance to make a movie and then that's it. We, don't, we, we, we need to find, um, you know, even w when, you know, working in, you know, giving an editor a chance to, to fail, somebody, give, you, you give them a shot at a scene and they, they don't nail it, being able to help them get there so they can understand, you know, so they can go through that process and they don't have the stigma of having, you know, not, not fulfilled the expectation. It's like, no, they can't do it. They didn't nail it, so we can't trust them anymore. You have to find ways of supporting that person and giving them a safe space to be able to fail so that they can do it again and again and again so they can get there and get the confidence and again get to know all of the people and go through it or like or watch me go through it. Um, I think that's the, for me, that's the most important thing that I'm trying to do right now with, with the crews that I work with is, is being able to take responsibility uh, for the movie as a whole so that everyone else under me gets a chance to participate in the process in a meaningful way gets to meet all the key people um, and again have a safe space where they can you know make mistakes and not be punished for it or you know not not be ostracized from the group because I think that's a big that's a big part of it so we're going to wrap up with one final question this one is just to be fun uh, favorite Halloween costume growing up my birthday is Halloween so I was always <laughs> sure I was a witch and I was waiting I thought something was going to happen on my 16th birthday where I would you know turn into a witch but it didn't. <laughs> so, so witch, of course. I love werewolves. I love uh, horror movies. Uh, Lon Chaney's Wolfman. Uh, loved all those movies. Howling. Um, so I would make a, uh, a you know, I, we, weren't, we didn't grow up a lot of money, so I, I would make a werewolf mask out of a paper bag that I would cut eye holes and a mouth hole, and then I would take uh, yarn and glue yarn to the paper bag all over it and uh, you know get the false you know teeth and and you know rip up a shirt and stuff like that so I was, I was a werewolf a lot. Um, I'd have to say the six million dollar man. I mean they were the cheesiest costumes it was like the plastic yeah, the mask with the rubber band and then like the the plastic drape. Yeah. Was it the tracksuit? Uh, <laughs> yeah but it was like printed on plastic and it was the most cheesy thing but yeah I mean he was my ultimate idol as a child and uh, so anything having to do with six million dollar man was. Uh... <laughs> uh, my favorite costume which became my costume several years was um, just something I enjoyed doing as a kid was making full plate mail like like a knight's armor out of uh, cardboard and silver duct tape 
and just, you know, trying to deck myself out in, in full armor and walk around the city like that, asking for candy. Well, those are very male answers, and my answer is going to be completely different, but I guess my favorite costume, because it's so silly, but I was a marshmallow. <laughs> so it was just a giant marshmallow and marshmallow little hat cap with little marshmallows in it, and I was a little chubby kid, so, you know, it sort of fit. <laughs> um, but probably there's some fun ones as kids, but I crashed a uh, South Park Halloween party, and I went as an 80s animator, and I wore a fanny pack and these, these <laughs> kind of puffy sweatpants and a Michael Bolton t-shirt and had this wig with a headband and these teeth, and no one knew, my friends didn't even know who I was. And I remember <laughs> Matt and Trey just looking at me, because I'd sit alone at this table drinking this beer, and they'd just go, oh, let that guy in. <laughs> I think it was the most gratifying Halloween, just like kind of freaking people out that you kind of know, you know, it was just. Well, we're out of time. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thank you. Thank you.